Hey you guys, let's talk about some more books. Now, here's the thing that happened, I think maybe on one of my last reviews, hmm, I can't remember which one it was, but I'm pretty sure it was one that was about one of the uh, leisure books paperbacks that came out like in the early 2000s, I wanna say. And I think in the context of that, I was talking about it not being super gross or like over the top gross in the same way that XYZ authors were. And I think one of the authors that I brought up in that, I don't want to call it a tirade, it wasn't that, but one of the authors that I brought up was Douglas Clegg. And I think I mentioned, I said, oh, I've got one of his books back there, thinking that it was like this really gross, uh, you know, kind of story. Now, this is another book that I read before. I read this back in 2003, somewhere around there. And I want, and I remembered liking it. So I was kind of like, okay, well, I want to do it again, you know, read it again for this show, like I've been doing with some of the other paperbacks that I had. And then when I was reading this, I was like, wait a minute, I'm pretty sure this isn't the book that I was thinking of at all. Which again, I think is what happened when I did um, that book, The Rainy Season, the one that I reviewed a few weeks ago. I think I had totally totally got that confused with like some other book. And I think I got this one confused with some other book too, but I can't for the life of me figure out what book I got it confused with. I don't know if it's another one that I have or it was one that I checked out of the library because like I said, I was reading a really, really lot of horror fiction. I bought a lot of leisure books, uh, you know, paperbacks around this time. So it's very, very possible that I could have like mixed some of them up with one another. And I'm pretty sure, so it's like, it was funny. I was like reading this and it was like, so I sort of remembered it, but then I was like, this is not the book that I was thinking about at all. And I don't even think it was a Douglas Clegg book that I was thinking about now that I'm thinking about it, but it was another one, like a leisure books one. So this book is Nightmare House. Now, the interesting thing about this, and this was something that I didn't know when I went back into rereading it, and I surely didn't know it the first time I read it. Uh, I only knew it when I was like doing a little bit of research for this show, was that this book is the first in a series, I think it's called the Harrow House series, because like the name of the titular Nightmare House is actually called Harrow, H-A-R-R-O-W, uh, yeah. And uh, so, yeah, so, but the weird thing about it though, at least according to what I could determine, was that even though this was the first one written, I think it's copyrighted 1999, but this one didn't come out until 2003. But the weird thing about it is that the second one in the series, which I'm not sure what it's called, but the second one in the series came out before this one came out. And then this one came out later. And I saw some reviews that speculated that maybe uh, because the second one was kind of successful, they went back and like released this one, which had been written earlier um, because most people, and I'd, like I said, I can't really say, but um, because I haven't read the second one or any of the other ones in the series, because maybe most people said that like the other ones in the series were really good, but this one, not so much, or this one was like, you know, kind of a mixed bag. And I will agree with that too, because I kind of feel like it's weird because the first time I read this, I remembered like really digging it. Like I said, when I thought about it later, like I was confusing it with another book, which I don't know why I did that, I guess, because like I said, I was reading a lot of leisure paperbacks around this time and a lot of a handful of the same authors at the same time. And so I kind of like mix some of the stories up, but I remember still liking this nonetheless, enough to be like, oh yeah, that was a good one. And I have to pull that, you know, to review on the show. But this time around, I didn't hate it, but there was just something really, really disjointed about it. I think that's like the best word that I can come up with. Um, I actually liked the first half of it a lot, but then once kind of supernatural stuff started happening in earnest, it just, it kind of lost me, which is like a weird thing to say, but I don't know. It seemed like much spookier, like at first. And then, you know, when you were kind of just going into the backstory of the house and like all this other stuff. But then once the mystery got resolved, I was just kind of like, man. And, and also I kind of felt like the paranormal stuff was like way over the top. And it seemed like it happened too quickly. Um, there was a lot of stuff that seemed like it happened too quickly or didn't have like enough development in this maybe. And I don't know if that's just like the writing style um, like I said, I thought that I had read some other books of Douglas Clegg's. I thought I read The Halloween Man, but, and I remember liking that, but I, now I can't remember if I actually did read it or not. It was just, like I said, I've read so much stuff, you guys, that I just can't even remember. Because sometimes I'll, 
I'll be like, oh yeah, I've been meaning to read that. And then I start reading. I'm like, oh wait, I already read this book. So I, so I do that a lot. Um, you know, it's cause I can't remember everything. You know what I mean? So basically what the story of this is, it's set mostly in 1926 or like, you know, the early, you know, 20th century, let's call it that. Now, our main character is a dude named Ethan Gravesend, although his real name is Esteban, which that kind of factors into like him having this name and then his name being different like later on. It's not like a huge deal, but it does kind of factor into it. But we'll just call him, call him Ethan because that's, you know, what he's called throughout most of the book. So Ethan, I guess what ends up happening when he was a kid, uh, and he kind of goes back and forth with this, you know, like flashbacks and stuff. When he was a kid, he used to stay with his grandfather sometimes at this really like cool mansion called Harrow, which I think is in upstate New York, so like in the Hudson Valley or something like that. Now his grandfather was like this really eccentric dude who he was one of those guys that had so much money. He was kind of reclusive and he was almost like a, like a Mrs. Winchester type, uh, you know, Sarah Winchester type person where not so much that he kept building onto the house, but well, he kind of did. He would have like all these things brought over like from Europe. So he would bring over like whole entire buildings that he liked. And he had this whole like ruined, cathedral type action like going on in the backyard like he like he brought it over from Europe but he just built it exactly the way it, like he didn't fix it up he just made it look like a ruin or whatever because he just liked the look of it so much so he has this big rambling old house and like I said he's kind of reclusive but he has like all this money and I guess I don't know like a lot of the townspeople I don't think they there, there's kind of like a question about how much of a good guy he was. The weird thing about it is that like the description on the back, I think the description on the back says built by a madman, which, you know, and I know that like the blurb on the back of the book generally isn't written by the writer. That's usually written by somebody that's like, you know, wants somebody to come across and go, hey, that sounds good. And like pick up and write the book, right? So it's like marketing people. But I never got the sense as the story unfolds that... Ethan's grandfather, whose name was Justin Gravesend, uh, was a madman. There was some ambiguity about it earlier, like you weren't really sure what he was up to in there. Um, and maybe some people thought he was a little weird, but he's not really a mess. So that's a little bit of a misnomer, I guess. A little bit, not really that big a deal. But I'm just, I'm just saying it makes it sound a lot more dramatic than it actually is. So he builds this house. And there's all kind of like rumors in town about it and whatnot, as there would be about any kind of like reclusive rich dude that built this bizarre mansion out in the middle of nowhere. So he ends up dying and his grandson, Ethan, who is his only living relative, ends up inheriting it. So pretty much near the beginning, he's kind of going out and like taking possession of the house. Now, along the way, he kind of remembers very fondly, like being a kid there. And, you know, he all, he remembers his grandfather being a lovely person and really the only person in his family that he could relate to in any way because his parents were like very distant and you kind of find out why later on. I won't spoil like all the plot points and stuff, but um, you find out later on like why his parents like treated him the way he treated him. So he was like, he, he, um, has very fond memories of being at Harrow as a child. And he also kind of has memories, which you find out later on, um, of the haunting around the house. Cause he says later on that when he was a kid, he used to see a little girl, like, you know, haunting the house and all this other kind of stuff. So it's 1926, he's taking over the house. And so he moves in and immediately there's kind of like a little bit of friction with there's, she's kind of like the servant housekeeper person uh, named Wentworth, who's one of those real kind of like busy body, moralistic, uptight kind of chicks, uh, you know, kind of an old grandmotherly type woman. And uh, he doesn't really get along with her all that much because, you know, he's kind of, Ethan is kind of like, he was married, but his wife left him. He's kind of like much more into like, he's like a modern guy, or at least, you know, modern in the, in the terms of the early 1920s. And, uh, you know, she's very moralistic and it's like, you know, these people don't even go to church and all this other kind of stuff. So there's kind of like some friction there. And then there's also this other kind of weird young woman who 
is sort of like, I guess she's like another housekeeper, like she's the other one like on the shift or whatever. Um, and her name is Maggie Barrow. And she's kind of like young and sort of foxy. Like, you know, she's got red hair, she's Irish, she's very fiery and like take no bullshit type of thing. And there's like a lot of people in the town think she's a witch maybe because she acts, she does kind of weird shit. Like it was, there's this great scene actually, like I said, near the front of the, like the first half of the book is actually really good. Like, cause it's building up all this like mystery and stuff where Ethan actually meets Maggie. He can't sleep one night or whatever. And he's kind of like wandering around in the, in the gardens and he sees her out there and there's like all these feral cats. That's kind of another thing that plays into it. And uh, there's all these feral cats and she's out there like picking like picking stuff out of the garden or whatever. And it's like, she looks like, it's like she almost looks like this mystical type of whatever out there. And like, that's kind of how they end up meeting. And uh, so, yeah, so that goes on and she has a son because I guess she, you know, she got pregnant and like then the husband took off and left her or whatever. But she kind of like, I guess she sort of lives on the grounds, but not in the big house. Like, cause there's other houses like outside the, you know, the thing for servants and whatnot. So she lives there. And a little bit of a romance starts to develop between her and Ethan. Although again, I think that's another thing that happens like way too quickly. It seems like one of those things where he's basically like, he just meets her and then like a day or two later, he's like, well, I'm in love. You know what I mean? And it's just kind of like, and it seems like it hasn't been very long since his last wife left him. And it's just, I don't know. It's just like, everything kind of happens like really quickly. So, like I said, the first half of the book is actually kind of cool. Like you're, you're kind of building up this mystery. He's talking a little bit about the history of the house, like the kind of the rumors around the house, the rumors that maybe his grandfather was into spiritualism or, you know, had invited all these kind of like Aleister Crowley and like Lizzie Borden and like people like that had like been to the house because it had all this mystical energy or whatever. And that maybe there was like some kind of satanic cult going on or whatever. And so there's that kind of like build up around it. And that's like pretty cool. Like Ethan kind of remembering what it was like growing up there and trying to square, you know, his childhood memories of his grandfather with some of the rumors that were swirling around it, but not necessarily that he was a Satanist, but that he had kind of all these spiritualist people hanging out there and it was like not entirely kosher. So there's that whole thing. Then right about the halfway point of the book, he's like exploring the house with Maggie and her son and you know, there's been like some haunting shit happening. Like he's seen uh, the ghost a couple, like he's seen like a little girl a couple of times. And as I said, he's not super surprised because he was there as a kid. And he so he knew that the place was haunted because he'd seen this little girl before. So he's seen her before and he's felt like all these weird sensations, um, you know, and some of the uh, manifestations are like w- really big time. It's not just kind of like, oh, I saw a little wispy, shadow of a little girl and her giggling. It's just kind of like, hey, look, the whole room like looks like it's covered with ice and like this crazy, crazy shit. And there's like all kind of like crazy, like poltergeist activity type happening. So it's that. So it's, it's funny because it's like the first half of it seems very subdued, but then like when the paranormal shit starts happening, it's just like way the fuck over the top. You know what I mean? It's just, it's a very strange uh, juxtaposition. So yeah, about the halfway point of the book, he's exploring the, uh, the house and there's this room because Maggie tells him something about essentially your grandfather built this house and there's like a house inside another house or there's like all these secret passages and they're usually behind the mirrors and stuff. And so there's this one room that he can't get into. And it's like, there's this big thing about Wentworth, the other servant, like she says she doesn't have the key. And then, you know, so, but they finally find the key and they open this door I think it's like up in the attic or somewhere. And like the, like the doorway has been like all bricked up behind the door. And then the door is also locked. So there's like, okay, well obviously something weird's going on back here. So they get a pickaxe or whatever and they bust it open. And in there they find a body that's been in there for a a while. You know what I mean? It's not like fresh. So at that point they have to call in the, you know, little town policeman whose name is Pocket. And uh, that's just, that's his name. He's, I guess that's his last name, but that's just what everybody calls him. Everybody just calls him Pocket. So Pocket comes to the house and basically there's, at this point, there's like a huge exposition dump, which actually I think was probably my favorite part of the book, like where Pocket comes there and he's basically like, yeah, I know who this body is and I know like what all the situation is. So he just like basically tells Ethan 
everything that happened. From there, it seems like the denouement of the of the book, like the the ending of it, came like really really quickly. Because what I had forgotten about when I was reading this was that see, it looks like this long, right? So I was like, I was got to like, you know, maybe this point here, and I was kind of like, oh, okay, well, there's still like a lot left. And then I forgot that there's actually another, there's like a bonus novella in the back of this called Purity, which I'll also talk to in a minute. So actually the book ended like way before I was expecting it to end because I was thinking like it's going on and on. It's like they they figure out like who this body is. They figure out this whole big secret about the house. There's like all this fucking, there's a big fucking Egyptian tomb underneath in the cellar and all this other kind of stuff. So they find all this stuff. And then I was just kind of like, okay, that's pretty, that's cool, whatever. And then like the book just ended because like I said, there was all this stuff left and I thought, that the book was going to continue, but it didn't. So it just like ended really quick. So I don't know if it was just because I was expecting it to be longer because I forgot that there was another novella at the end, but it just seemed like it ended kind of abruptly, which I thought was kind of odd. But yeah, so like I said, all together, like the first part of this, um, the first part of this book, I actually really dig. I liked all the stuff about the history of the house, all the stuff about the spiritualists and maybe Maggie is a witch and maybe this, like, it's just, it was all very like mysterious. I liked that it was set in the 1920s and stuff like that. So I kind of liked all that about it. I liked all the buildup and all the mystery and stuff. But then like once the ghostly shit started happening and once, you know, the body got found, it just seemed like everything just like happened like really quickly. Like I said, there's, you know, Pocket shows up to investigate the body being behind the walls. Like, you know, the, she'd been like walled in. Ethan's like, wait, did my grandfather do that? Cause what the fuck? So, you know, and then, and then Pocket comes in, he's like, no, 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 I know what the whole situation is. And then like, he tells him all about it. And then from that point forward, it just seemed like the rest of the book was them like, uh, investigate because something bad happens with Maggie and then they end up having to like investigate the house and finding all this stuff in the cellar. But it didn't seem, it seemed like it, that needed more time. You know what I mean? Um, I kind of feel like Ethan falling in love with Maggie, that happened way too quickly because like I said, it's like they met and then like a couple pages later, he's like, oh my God, I love her forever. Um, that was a little strange. I, they do that a lot in movies too. It's like, I don't know, it just seems really unrealistic. So there was that, but I don't know. So, so I kind of feel like the pacing of it was a little bit strange other than Ethan who was actually like a decent character, but the other characters, you didn't really get to spend enough time with them to to really get any sense of them as people, you know? And cause like I said, some of them were just in a few scenes and then it seemed like they were way more important than, I don't know. So it seemed like there was a lot of stuff that was introduced, you know, about like the spiritualism about this and that, like shit did happen and they did kind of explain, but I don't know, like I said, the, the word that would best describe at least the second half would be a little bit disjointed. I just thought it was a very disjointed type of story. Now, like I said, I'm not gonna like cast dispersions on the rest of his shit because from what I can determine, like at least from the reviews, is that this is part of a series uh, that went on like about this house. And apparently like the next books in the series are actually like really, really good. And I think are even set in like the modern day. Whereas this one was set, uh, you know, in 1926. Now I'm not saying like, cause on Goodreads, this does have like plenty of like four and five rev star reviews. I'm not saying that, but it did seem like the, you know, the one and two star reviews and some of the DNF reviews uh, um, were kind of like, they all had kind of the same criticisms of it. And I would, and I can kind of see where they're coming from. I didn't like, I didn't get to a point where I'm like, oh, I'm not going to finish this or this sucks or whatever. I didn't get to that point, but it did get to a point like after it got to the halfway point where I was just kind of like, I was just waiting to like get it done. And then, and then it was just when it finished, I was just kind of like, um, uh, I, then I wasn't kind of ready to be finished with it because I just thought it wasn't developed enough. I don't know. It's like, it's, it's kind of a complicated thing to get across. It's just, there were so many good ideas in here and I just felt like they weren't developed sufficiently. That's all I'm saying. Like a lot of stuff was like brought up and then I just felt like it wasn't, because there was a lot of stuff that was brought up. Like I said, there was the whole spiritualist angle. You know, there was the whole thing with, uh, you know, the, the woman walled up in the thing. There was the whole thing about maybe the granddad and all, there was, a, so there was a lot of like tendrils there that I feel like didn't quite, that weren't quite developed all the way. It didn't quite connect in a way that was satisfying, at least to me, I guess, uh, is what I'm trying to say. So like I said, it was not a great reading experience. The first half of it is definitely the best part, but you know, not a, not bad overall. And like I said, I would totally, um, 
read some of the others in the series because I do like the idea behind this house and I do like the concept of it. I don't know. So maybe I can judge better like when I read some of the other ones in the series. Now, uh, again, what I was going to say, actually, the novella that's at the end of this, like I said, it's kind of like a bonus novella. It's about, let me see, I can't remember how many pages it is. It's about, it's about that long, <laughs> if you're like looking at it. And it's called Purity. And it's interesting because I actually liked, I think I liked the novella better than the actual, better than the novel itself. Because this one, Purity was not necessarily, I want to say it's not necessarily supernatural. It was actually um, just about this guy uh, named Owen, who was a psychopath. He was a self-described psychopath, so sociopath. He lived on this island where all of these people would, like rich people would come in vacation. And he, I guess his dad was like a gardener on this on these rich people's like, property or their estate or whatever. So he had grown up being kind of in love with this, with the daughter of the family, like the really rich girl. So it's kind of like describes this one summer where she comes back, you know, they're grown up now and she comes back with another boyfriend and he's like kind of plotting how to get her, or get rid of the other guy. Um, and there's also like a Lovecraftian element too, because he worships Dagon essentially. Um, and he has this little, uh, you know, like a little statue of him and shit like that. So it's, but l I liked that actually quite a bit better, even though I'm more of a fan of haunted house stuff than straight ahead, like sociopath, psychopath, serial killer type stuff. But I don't know. I just, I thought the novella was actually like much better written. I forgot to mention this too, but the main book, Nightmare House, one of the oddest things about it, this is a very odd choice and I'm sure he did it on purpose, but you know, even though most of the book was from Ethan's point of view, he was like the main character, every now and then it would switch back and forth from first person to third person, like sometimes in the same chapter, like for a little go from one section uh, where he's talking like, I did this, that, and the other. And then in the next section, he's like, and then Ethan did this and that. And it's like, he kind of explained why he did that, but I don't really know I, you know, I, I don't really know if it was justified and in a lot of ways it was just like really confusing and it like kind of took me out of the story. Like I get why he was, what he was going for, I suppose. It just, I don't know, it was like, it was kind of jarring that he kept like switching back and forth like that. So that was another thing that I forgot to mention. But yeah, so like I said, it's worth reading if you like haunted house stuff. It's doing something a little bit different, like with the haunted house thing, not super different, but I don't know. I kind of like the concept behind it. Um, and maybe, like I said, the other books in the series got better, at least like the reviews uh, said that they did. But yeah, it just came off as a little disjointed. However, I did really like the novella at the end. Um, I actually like that better than the actual book. So, you know, keep that in mind if you uh, want to read it. And But like I said, I'm pretty sure I might have read some other Douglas Clegg and liked it. So maybe this is just one of his earlier ones. I'm not really sure. Uh, so we'll, we'll figure something out. We'll, we'll like, we'll read some more in the series and see how it turned out. But yeah. All right. So that'll do it for this Tomes of Terror and I will see you guys on the next one. Bye.